Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is the third podcast in the Life on Earth series. In this one, I'm going to talk about things that aren't really alive, and those are viruses. In 1982, Richard Scrento, when he was a 15-year-old high school student, um, was sick of people taking his discs and borrowing his discs, and so he both basically wrote a program called the Elk Cloner that would copy itself onto the computer, and then it would copy itself onto discs that were injected into the computer. Basically, it would boot up the 50th time it would give you this warning, this little poem, and it was really highly infectious. In fact, it was the first really infectious uh, computer virus that was ever written. And so the program was able to move from computer to computer to computer. If there's no computer, then there's no computer virus. And so viruses work the same way. These right here are bacteriophages. And basically what they do is they inject their DNA into a bacteria. They use the machinery of the bacteria to make copies of themselves. In other words, they're going to make copies of the DNA. They're then going to take the DNA to make messenger RNA, RNA and then make proteins. And then those proteins are going to enclose the DNA and then they're going to disperse and they're going to move to another bacteria. And so viruses spread using cells. If there's no cell, just like if there's no computer, then there's no virus. And that's why we don't classify them as alive. They definitely have elements of living things, uh, but they don't have metabolism. They don't have reproduction on their own without a cell to inject it in. And so basically, it's important to study viruses because they're one of the main sites of diseases that we have. In other words, millions of people were killed by the influenza outbreak on the heels of World War I, uh, the 1918 influenza virus. This is a reproduction of what that virus looked like, or herpes virus, or polio virus, or look at all these viruses over here that infect us. And so basically, if it weren't for our cells, they couldn't, copy, uh, make, make, they couldn't make copies of themselves. And so where did viruses come from? Well, we probably will never know the right answer to this, but here's a few theories. There's the cellular theory that they used to be part of cells. And so a plasmid, for example, is given off by bacteria, can be picked up by other bacteria. And so maybe they started that way, or maybe they were full-on cells that regress. So chlamydia, for example, uh, is a type of cell that's lost the ability to live on its own, and so now it's an obligate parasite. Or it could have been coevolution that these viruses were evolving with cells, just like insects and plants were evolving together. This is a little viroid, uh, which is a little bit of RNA plant virus. And so there's, there's evidence to suggest that any of these theories could have produce that first virus, but nonetheless, we eventually had viruses. So what are some characteristics in the structure of a virus? Well, all viruses are going to have nucleic acid, so they have to have some kind of genetic material. Sometimes that is DNA, and sometimes that is RNA. Sometimes that DNA is double-stranded, and sometimes it's single-stranded. And sometimes that RNA is normal, single-stranded, and sometimes it's double-stranded. And so these are all different types of genetic material that could be found inside a virus, but they're all genetic material. So that's the thing that all viruses have. The other thing that all viruses have is a protein coat. In other words, they have the coat that surrounds that virus. One of the first viruses really understood and crystallized and seen is the tobacco mosaic virus. And you can see here's the two parts of it. It's got RNA in a coiled pattern, and then it's going to have these protein subunits that go around the outside, so they protect that DNA. Now, a lot of the time, that whole protein is simply two different types of protein. We call those protein subunits. And you can see here that just having those two proteins, it can self-assemble into this shape or this characteristic viral shape. And so all viruses are going to have these two things. But a lot of viruses are also going to have an envelope. So they're going to have a lipid bilayer. And so this right here would be human immunodeficiency virus or the virus that causes AIDS. And you can see here that we've got RNA on the inside. We've got a capsid or a protein coat around the outside, but now we've got this lipid bilayer around the outside or this envelope. Now, why is that important? If we say this is a typical cell, let's say this is a typical cell in your upper respiratory tract, and let's say you're being infected by a rhinovirus or a virus that causes a common cold, well, around the outside of your cell is going to be an envelope. And so if we have another virus with a, a genetic material in a capsid, but let's say that they have an envelope around the outside, when it attaches to your cell, those two envelopes, if it looks exactly the same, is going to fuse with that, and it makes it easy for that virus to gain entry. Likewise, when it lyses the cell or when it explodes, if it takes a little bit of that envelope with it, it's much, less, it's much more likely to be able to infect another cell. And so a lot of these envelopes 
are gathered from the cell in which they infected, in which they are leaving. So how do they reproduce? How does this actually work? Well, the viral life cycle is, is two parts. There's the lytic cycle. Lytic comes from the word lice or to break. And so let's kind of look right here at a bacteriophage. A bacteriophage, remember, infect bacteria. And so what this one is doing is injecting its genetic material, in this case DNA, into a bacteria. So it injected its DNA into a bacteria. As that cell makes copies of itself, you can see it's making copies of the DNA. Next thing it's doing, so how did it do that? It's using DNA polymerase. So it's using the machinery of the cell to make a copy, erase, uh, to make a copy of the DNA. What's going next? Well, right here you can see it's using that DNA to make proteins. And so how does it do that? Well, in this case, it's using RNA polymerase, and it's also using ribosomes. And so it's using the ribosomes inside the cell to make proteins. And so this right here would be transcription and translation. Eventually, we have our genetic material, we have the proteins, and now we're going to lyse the cell. And so what's happening is these viruses are actually erupting from the cell. Where are they headed? They're headed to another cell to inject their DNA and, and make copies of itself. And so that's how you can just get a few viruses and you can get a huge viral outbreak where pretty soon, exponentially, we're going to have billions and billions of viruses being created. And so that's one part of the life cycle. If you look at the second part of the life cycle, that's called the lysogenic cycle. In other words, it can generate the lytic cycle. What happens here? Well, basically, they inject their DNA in. It becomes part of the genetic material of the cell. And then every time the cell makes a copy of itself, it's making a copy of that virus. And so that's kind of insidious. It's almost like a stealth mode where they're injecting their DNA. It's not actually making viruses, but it's using the machinery of the cell to copy it over and over and over again. So quick example in humans, because this is uh, in bacteria. So if you've ever had chickenpox, that's a virus. It's, infect it's infecting its DNA into the cells of your body. It's forming these pox, which is releasing more of the virus to infect more of the cells. And so it's going through this lytic cycle. Um, eventually, your immune system is going to shut it down, but this cell has injected its DNA and it will actually sit in the DNA inside you. And so it can stay there, it can manifest itself decades later in another form of uh, chickenpox called shingles. And so it's the same DNA that's just been hitchhiking around, waiting and waiting. So it's in that lysogenic cycle. And a lot of viruses will jump between the two. And so they'll be in the lysogenic cycle. Cold sores on the mouth would be an example of that. It's just hiding in your neural cells. All of a sudden, your immune system gets depleted. They jump into the lytic cycle, make a bunch of copies of that, and then they can eventually go back. And so those are viruses. Are they alive? No. Are they important? Yes. And I hope that's helpful.